the hell are they doing when Akron, you called me out last episode and now I'm here. Hey everyone and welcome to Matt's Madness. Your usual host, Matty Trevisano, is on break this week, so I'm Griffin Lee and I'm here today filling in. We're not even a week into the college basketball season and there's already so much to talk about, but I'm going to hand it over to these guys, Colin and Matt. How are you guys doing? Good, good. I feel like, uh, Matt, this is long overdue. We've been We've been doing this together for five years and we're finally able to debate with each other. I'm excited. I know, I know. And, you know, like usual, uh, my opponent's going to be going down. So, Colin, this is your job. <laughs> okay. Hey, you, you <laughs> called me out last episode and, and now I'm here. So, I did. let's see what you got. I did. But, well, let's see what we guys got going on today. Tuesday was one, was a day one of college hoops. And, Matt, you were uh, at the Champions Classic uh, where Kansas took down Michigan State in game one. And, uh, Duke took down uh, Kentucky in game two. Uh, gentlemen, who impressed you more, the Jayhawks or the Blue Devils? Colin, if you want to start off. Oh, All right. Um, well, uh, last episode, you guys were, were talking uh, a little down on the Blue Devils, but I think they impressed everybody. Uh, I think it's very fair to say that coming into this season, uh, everyone underrated Duke for once. And uh, I think this might have been – you know, one of those most recent years where people should not have done that. You know, you have two top fre- freshmen in Keels and Bonchero who combined for nearly 50 points. And, you know, that's just two guys. I mean, let's also look at the six upperclassmen that they have. And don't forget about Justin Roach and the big man, Mark Williams, which may be the first true big man they've had since dating back to Marvin Bagley. Uh, And, you know, you look at the team and everything was just clicking on defense. They had nine steals, five blocks. They only turned the ball over nine times. And, you know, they were able to not even shoot the ball well, but they still got the job done and everything looked like it clicked. And, you know, like you mentioned last episode, this is Coach K's final year. And I think that's exactly how you should start off your season underneath the, uh, the GOAT's final season. Yeah, and I, I got to admit, Colin, that was a really that was a really good game. I thought that was the more entertaining game. And, and yeah, I'll give you credit where it's due. I mean, Kentucky's a really good team. They're a top 10 team as well. I just look at this Kansas game and, you know, obviously Jalen Wilson being out and Kansas had to go small. Bill Self admitted it afterwards. They're not going to go small like that. And it was a little bit of a learning curve for him this season, starting four guards. And then also to that point, you know, Mitch Lightfoot, I know he's kind of like a five year guy. He's been in the program forever, but. You know, he's never really gotten that footing down. And then Zach Clements as well. I mean, a freshman that has to come off the bench at that forward spot. And when you look at the Spartans, it's a team that with Marcus Bingham Jr., Gabe Brown, and Joey Hauser starts three forwards. And I know that Hauser is, you know, just a typical small forward, but that's a bigger lineup. Michigan State has a real big lineup. So to me, the fact that Kansas was able to turn it on in the second half and, you know, withstand uh, any Michigan State late runs, to me – that's more impressive. I don't know. I mean, I see your point, but I just got to think that when, when you're out with a guy like Jalen Wilson, who's not able to play um, that that's kind of a bigger win to me. Uh, I know, I know Kansas definitely played. I will say like they dominated the whole game. Um, But I think you can say Duke played just as well. They led uh, for almost the entire game other than just three minutes And going back to what I said about, you know, shooting the ball, they went one from 13 from deep. And we know over the past that Duke is a team that will shoot at will from behind the arc. We all know that. We've seen that since it was back with John Shire, Quinn Cook, and a young Tyus Jones. So I think think Kansas did have a good win. But let's be honest, Michigan State, I don't think they're as talented as they used to be. Yeah, they made the final four run two years ago, and obviously – we couldn't really play any ball last year, but I don't know. I just against a good Michigan. I'm not. I'm not discrediting Michigan State whatsoever. Michigan State, the Spartans, are a good basketball team, but I don't think they're as good as Kentucky and Duke. Not shooting as well as they can. I think Duke has the up the the better. Colin, I mean, uh, to your point though, you got a Kentucky team that was under 500 last year, and I know that Michigan State had a bad year as well. And I'm not going to blame anything on COVID. But I, I kind of see that point as well. I mean, I, I see a Kentucky team that brought in so many transfers and Coach Calipari maybe doesn't know what to do with them just yet. So I think right there, you know, I'm not going to say Duke gets a pass. I still think that that's a very, very good win. I just think that when you're without a talent in Jalen Wilson, that's a big time win, especially on a neutral court. 
That's fair, but I think you can say the same thing about Michigan State. What I think they were uh, two games over 500 last year. You know, Tom Izzo didn't really have a great year either. So I don't know. I would love to see a Kansas Duke matchup at some point, maybe back in the Elite Eight, like a couple of years ago. We'll see. But I think you got to give the Duke, the Blue Devils, the edge on this one. I think that's exactly how you had to start the season. That matchup would be big time. Absolutely. That that game on uh, those two games on Tuesday were. Uh were great thrillers that we uh, were very happy to see. And Matt, I'm sure you had a great time out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sticking in the ACC, uh, only one top 25 team has gone down so far in Virginia. Uh, but last night, Coach Bobby Hurley and Arizona State lost uh, on an improbable shot uh, beyond half court to UC Riverside. Uh, which loss was worse out of all of these? Uh, Matt, you can start us off. Yeah, um, I got to go with the Arizona State loss for for a few reasons. I mean. First off, whenever you lose on a play like that, I mean, it's just so tough because you coach your kids not to foul. Um, obviously, a foul happens, and just two just two uh, free throws would have tied it up. So, you know, it wasn't like it was a three-point game or anything. All they needed was two. So that's really a danger zone. You know, it's a mid-major team that has nothing to lose, and you don't want to foul. But I think it's also worse for another reason, and that's the fact that when you look at Bobby Hurley, I think going into the season, he's on a little bit of a hot seat because Arizona State's had some really good talents in the past few seasons. Hurley really hasn't been able to do enough with them. And I know you look at last year, Remy Martin, a guy that, you know, transfers from Arizona State to Kansas in the offseason. He didn't really do a lot with that team. And Remy Martin was a great, great player, obviously, with Bagley and with Josh Christopher. I mean, Arizona State had a lot of good players last year. This is a whole new year. That's not a great start when you're losing, even the fact that you're in that position against a UC Riverside team that probably isn't even going to finish top three in their conference, which is clearly a mid-major. So, you know, I know that the Virginia loss may look worse on paper, but I think that the way the Arizona State loss happened, that's, that's a little bit worse to me. I think that's a fair point. You said that really well, especially with how they lost. I mean, hey, a half-court shot, you're down to – how many times out of 10 is that shot going to go in, right? So I think the way they lost is worse. But overall, as, an, as a performance, UVA, I mean, oh, my Lord. You know the Cavaliers as a defense team. And there was no defense. And if you want to talk about mid-majors with nothing to lose, this is Navy's first top 25 win since 1986. And it wasn't a buzzer beater. It wasn't a close game. Navy led almost the entire game. Virginia didn't have a lead since three minutes into the first half. And I think, you know, your offense, you have six bench points. You can't be doing that as an ACC team with the competition coming up. Your defense, where was the identity? Navy shot over 50% from three, 45% from the field. And, you know, in the ACC where there's a lot of talent this year. I know you had North Carolina, Sam had Florida State, there's Duke, there's also Syracuse. You know, who knows who comes out of the ACC this year, but with that tough of a conference, you can't be having a slow start losing to a team like Navy. You know, Colin, I feel like this begs maybe another question too, is who's in more trouble out of those two? Because, you know, I see Arizona State, again, where Hurley's on the hot seat. They're in a Pac-12 conference that's deeper and, and a lot better than usual. And then I see Virginia where, while their coach might not be on the hot seat, and I guess that's why I kind of went with Arizona State there. I mean, Virginia's been kind of one of the biggest programs in the ACC over the past couple of years. So I don't know. I, I might go to your point there that Virginia might want to turn this around quicker, but Arizona State's um, – Hurley himself is on the hot seat. The team's probably probably not as much. I think both both teams definitely need to get back on track very soon or the season could go downhill very fast. But I don't know, losing to Navy, your biggest lead being only two points all the way back at the beginning of the first half. That, that's got to hurt your momentum, especially going, like I said, into one of the deepest conferences in the country in the ACC. And that's, that's a good point, too, because the ACC is extremely, extremely deep. And I know the Pac-12 with UCLA and Oregon this season, that's going to be a dogfight as well because it really hasn't been in past years. Um, man, I just think it's tough, too, because you look at Navy, and, and Navy's – the thing is to me is Navy, while they might not have had as much to lose, they're at least in a little better of a position, especially as a program. You know, they're a little bit more well-known and whatnot. 
like you see Riverside just comes in there and, and they just kind of punch Arizona State in the gut. I mean, like, <laughs> like it was like, I don't know. It's just, it's a low scoring game. And I was just kind of like, what's going on? Like, what, why is Arizona State not dropping 75 points on this team? 80 points. Right. And I think you could say the same thing about Virginia. Why, where was Virginia's offense? I mean, what, you're, you're going to have your starters score almost all of your points. You cannot have you in any college basketball. I mean, even in a high school game, you can't have your bench score single digit points. I just, I don't think that's realistic in any sort of game. And, you know, if, if this is what we're looking towards um, in the ACC, especially from Virginia, I think we got to put Sam, make sure Sam is doing okay. <laughs> Because he he might be getting a little worried too. Yeah, it might be a problem this year for the Cavaliers. <laughs> and these are some uh, two teams that we expect to see in the tournament. So uh, hopefully they can turn things around definitely and get things going and uh, get their top seeds going. So uh, some other teams also had some close calls this week, but we're able to come away with wins. Uh, this one's not going to be uh, just between those two choices, Colin. Uh, which of these, which of the top twenty-five teams this year? Uh, not named Virginia has the most work to do in your eyes. So I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here. This is maybe, you know, not the team people were expecting. I had my big 10 season preview a few weeks ago and I had Maryland coming in as the fifth best team in the big 10. Now they are two and up. They are undefeated to start the season, but Hey, those are two wins against teams that, you know, should have been blowouts and you only beat George W, excuse me, George Washington by seven points. You only beat Quinnipiac by 13 points. You got to be more confident and you definitely have to show more confidence as well on the court. You know, there's chemistry issues on offense. You have 13 turnovers in both games. You have transfers come in. So you can definitely tell that that team is still trying to mesh together. And just like, just like what I said with the Cavaliers, with the Terrapins, you got to make sure you get all those bumps in the road out early before you go into conference playing the Big Ten. Or that fifth, that fifth conference seed that I had could turn into an eight, nine, maybe even a tenth, and you could miss the tournament completely. Yeah, that, that's honestly a good point. And I'm sticking in the Big Ten, Colin. I'm going with Ohio State because, man, I mean, you see Akron, and I'm a big fan of the MAC. Um, I'm not going to discredit the Mac at all. I am going to discredit what Ohio State, how Ohio State played against this Akron team. Lauren Christian Jackson was by far the Zips play, best player last season. He averaged 22 and six assists. He's gone. Their next best scorer from last season, Brian Trimble, averaged about 12 points a game. So you figure he's in the shadow of a guy like like Christian Jackson. He's going to go off this season. Maybe, you know, you're going to see a lot of improvement out of him. What does he do? He scores five points on two of eight shot shooting against this Ohio State team. And I'm not going to go out and say that EJ Liddell's the problem because he went 10 of 19, 25 points. I mean, he had a big game. He did what he needed to do against this Akron team. What I am going to do is going to look at the guards um, because, you know, you've got Michi Johnson Jr., four points, 0 of three from the field. And then you've got Jamari Wheeler, two points, 0 of three from the field. What the hell are they doing when Akron's best player is now gone this season and you guys are going to go a combined 0 for six from the field against the Zips? I mean, that's got to that's gotta be turned around. And I know that you're trying to feed it into Liddell. I know that these guys aren't expected to come in and shoot 12, 15 times a game. That's Liddell's job. That's Zed Key's job. You know, you even got swaying off the bench. And my goodness, I'm looking at that now, one of seven for two points. So you've got all these guys that are really supposed to deliver a little bit of a punch, a little bit of, you know, get some points in here or there, at least take some more shots. And they did nothing against Akron. I hope that's just a one-time thing because that's brutal. I will, I, you know, I'm the same way. And, and not just the way they play, but the way they reacted to winning that game. They were celebrating like they just made it to the final four, especially after just getting knocked out in the first round. I mean, as an old team, you have 10 upperclassmen on that Buckeye team. You got to be doing better than that. But, you know, on the contrary, Liddell fouls out. He plays, like you said, incredibly well. Um, but Ohio State played well. Akron played better. They would not miss. I mean, they were shooting incredibly. And 
I think the good thing about Ohio State, which is why I'm not too concerned, is what I brought up, how they're so stacked heavily with upperclassmen, is that I think they'll be able to, you know, get through this. I mean, who in the world wants to have to think that they almost lost to Akron after being a Final Four favorite in a lot of people's eyes last season, losing to Oral Roberts? I think Ohio State will bounce back very quickly, but I'm on the same page as you. That loss, or excuse me, that win, almost a loss, is incredibly concerning if you're a Buckeyes fan. Yeah, and excuse me if I misspoke earlier. I, I don't know if I said loss or win, but obviously the Buckeyes coming away with the win there. But that just seems so bad. It almost seems like a loss. I mean, that Akron team, realistically, it should not have been close. And to your point, Colin, I'm going to stick with this for a little bit because the Big Ten, we, we both went with Big Ten teams, and we both have very valid points. Maryland has not – they've looked very shaky. And Ohio State uh, really didn't deserve to come away with the win there. So you've got two Big Ten teams there that did not play well in, in Ohio State's opener. And Maryland, who's, like you said, have two games already. They couldn't turn it around after one. They went and struggled in the second game. So I look at this right now as a Big Ten that has been really, really good over the past couple of years. Maybe it's falling off a little bit. But then again, you look and you see Kudus Wahab going for 18 and 15 and, and EJ Liddell with that monster game against Akron. So I don't know. It's just college basketball, man. It's college basketball. It's college basketball. And, you know, I think both of these teams are, in my eyes, I think they're locks for the NCAA tournament in a very strong Big Ten. So hopefully they both bounce back. I think the Big Ten is, is one of the most interesting conferences in, in the country other than the ACC. I mean, you have – Michigan, who in my eyes is one of my favorite teams to watch as a potential national championship winner. And then you have teams like Purdue, Illinois, who may run underneath the radar this year as well, especially after losing their top players. So the Big Ten is going to be very interesting to watch. I'm very excited myself to see what the Big Ten brings. Uh, I am full agreement with both of you guys on that. I think that Maryland and Ohio State are both two teams that we need to be looking out for. Uh, going forward and was expecting more out of uh, out of Maryland last night, but uh, I kind of had a feeling that George Washington was going to do something there. Yeah. Um, but we're rolling through the season. Things are going well. Uh, looking forward to next week's slate of games. Um, Maddie should be back next week, but I'm Griffin Lee. And thank you so much for watching another episode of Matt's Madness.